Hello. Uh, good morning, everybody. I hope you had a good night's sleep and rest. Uh, we're about to start our first panel of this conference. Uh, my name is Blendis Laj. I am honored to uh, be moderating this panel with all our distinguished guests. And uh, I hope that we all get to learn some new things and uh, reinforce some of the things we know and share this experience together. Before I go on, uh, I'd like to uh, point to everyone that the badges uh, which contain a QR code could be scanned uh, and you would get a uh, detailed agenda of the conference, of all the speakers on each day, because what's printed in the back, it's a general uh, overview of the conference. Details, uh, you need to scan the QR code to, to get. So. Uh, uh, please do that if you, if you need to uh, know everything exactly, if you are one of those types of people that need to know uh, everything that way. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to, uh, to present and say a couple of words of uh, uh, our uh, distinguished guests this morning. Uh, first off to my left, uh, Mrs. Atilda Jonay. She is an MP of the Albanian Parliament. Uh, she's also the member of the Integration Committee of the Parliament and former Minister of Justice of Albania. She oversaw many important legal initiatives aiming at empowering women in politics, economy, education, and the social sphere in general. Uh, also, uh, Mrs. Lisa Gashi is the Deputy Foreign Affairs Minister of Kosovo. She was born and was living in Costa Rica, one of the most beautiful places in the world, when Kosovo declared independence. She studied at Arizona State University, and then before joining politics, she created German uh, NGO to engage more than 800,000 Kosovars outside the country in the policy-making process, networking, job creation, and diplomacy. Um, also with us is Fatmira Isaki. She is a current Deputy uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs for North Macedonia, but also a successful woman who started her career in 2005 as a spokeswoman for the Democratic Party of the Albanians. She's the mother of two children and continues education. Uh, she is currently a PhD candidate from the Blaj Koneski Faculty of Psychology uh, in Skopje, at the University of Skopje. Phil I'm sorry, philology, at the University of uh, St. Cyril uh, uh, Methodist University in Skopje. Also, and I want to get this right, so I, I wrote it in, uh, in Albanian. Um, uh, we have uh, Mrs. Uh, Maya Vavžik. Uh, she is from the uh, uh, IVF and uh, Maya has a long career in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Poland. She can be uh, able to expand on more topics of leadership and women's rights in Eastern Europe and the Western Balkans. Also, she can expand more on how the International Visegrad Fund has become one of the most important organizations in Eastern Europe, having been formed in 2000 to support with grants CSOs of the V4 EU candidacy at that time of Poland, the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Slovakia. Uh, also with us is uh, Maja Reitzewicz. She is the executive director of Women's Rights Center since 2012. Center for Women's Rights empowers women to fight for a better position in society and access to justice, offering them counseling, psychological, and legal assistance. And then at the end of this panel, we have uh, Professor Gavin Patrick Gray. Uh, he is in the developing the communications program at the College of Policy Studies at the Tsuda University in Tokyo, Japan. Currently engaged in research supported by the Japanese government on violence against women and children in Japan. So we'll get a perspective from the other side of the world and how things are developing over there. Other areas of interest for the professor include international security, terrorism, and also propaganda. So, uh, Atida, I would like to start with you. And uh, as I mentioned before, you've been uh, at the core of pushing forward legal changes that would empower women um, 
to, to, to uh, partake in politics, partake in decision making, and, and be part of uh, leadership in institutions, businesses, and organizations. What is the reasoning behind that strive to, to uh, grant more access uh, to women in, in power positions? First of all, uh, let me thank you for this invitation. And of course, even in the name of the Speaker of the Parliament, uh, Madame Nicola, uh, I want to give her greetings for organizing uh, such uh, event that when I saw the title Unstoppable, uh, it was uh, very uh, impressive because in the end of the day, uh, this is our goal to have unstoppable women uh, in power and in politics. Uh, of course, that um, being a woman in politics, it's uh, very challenging. It's not said uh, just only by me or by an Albanian politician. Uh, it is said by all the women that are in politics. Mm. And um, I've been uh, worked and uh, contributed for civil society for 12 years. And then for three years as uh, deputy ombudsman uh, in Albania. So I was totally out of the politic. And uh, in the moment that I was invited to be uh, first deputy minister of justice and after that minister of justice, for me it was totally something that I haven't, uh, hadn't thought about that. Uh, in one way, we do politics in our daily life, despite that we are in civil society or in academia or uh, in other fields, uh, because we try to push uh, with our efforts in order that the politics could change. And uh, I was the first uh, woman uh, Minister of Justice in history of Ministers of Justice in Albania. And this was the first uh, challenge because uh, it was always, uh, I've been always in such as a challenge that, yeah, there have been the men that uh, have been uh, ministers of justice, but now you are women, so you have to do something different in order that uh, could be count. And mm -hmm. sometimes we see this not just only in the higher positions in the government, but uh, in all uh, positions when women are taking leadership. And I should add, that was when justice reform was, was coming to life. So it wasn't an easy time to be Minister of Justice. Second, uh, I was uh, uh, the, the second record that uh, everybody mentioned always is that I've had full term mandate for four years as Minister of Justice. Because in the past, all the ministers uh, have been in position for two years or one year and a half. So I've been the minister with a longer life in that ministry in a very difficult moment, in a very challenging moment, not just only for the Ministry of Justice, for, but for Albania. Uh, I've been charged for implementation of the justice reform when everything uh, had started from the scratch, when all the laws were approved, changing all the system, uh, trying to build a new architecture new establishing new institutions with the new people, with the new laws. But what has had more importance, it was with the new mentality. So this was the first challenge that it, it was in front of me. Uh, in the end of four years uh, mandate, uh, I think that uh, I succeeded. But of course, not just only me. Because it's very important to mention that women, especially in leadership, always see uh, their function, their mission, in a team, as a team. So uh, this is the reason why women uh, always succeed on their uh, challenging. Because uh, they always consider themselves that are not working alone, or their success is just only by themselves, but it's about uh, all the team that is working on that. So, uh, second, it was really I want to, to share with you, uh, for the first time that we introduced one regime that it's uh, a special regime in the prisons, 
uh, it wasn't imaginable that a woman could uh, run prisons, despite that I've had in the civil society these experiences, uh, uh, trying to, to work with the prisoners and their rights. Uh, I've introduced for the first time some uh, pieces of legislation for 41 special regime, for the organized crime groups. And so isolation for dangerous criminals. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's called 41 Bs. And uh, uh, it was very difficult. And when I've uh, discussed with the former Minister of Justice of Italy that they have done before us, she told to me, and I went in Rome, and she told to me that, uh, Etilda, are you alone or do you have some guards that are coming with you in this event that we are going together? And I told to, to her that, uh, me, as Minister of Justice, even in Albania, I have just only one guard. And uh, it's normal, because all the ministers have just only one guard. And she told to me, yes, but you are implementing the justice reform with all enemies that are around. And second, you are implementing the 41 piece that is most difficult uh, regime that we have had in Italy. And of course, that even in Albania is as dangerous as in Italy. And some of the colleagues that uh, find out the, uh, the special regime for the first time were just only trying to say, it, yeah, but you are putting in the papers, but not implementing for real. But I think that uh, the results coming after that uh, showed very well uh, how uh, good results can women give in different positions when they are focused and I think that it could be just done by the women. And the third challenge, I don't want to, to no, go it's long, it's uh, it was the fight against corruption. Of course, the fight against corruption, it's, it's a problem and an issue to all our countries. But it is true that it's a link between women in power and uh, less corruption. Because women are, by nature, by the way how they uh, feel and fulfill their mission, that is less corruption. Because they are more transparent, they are more uh, uh, focused on the, on, the, on the goal, and uh, in the end of the day, they are uh, women that stay in the offices and not going around as men in, in bar, trying to, to make connections and so on. So I think that these studies that show that more women in power, less corruption, is totally true. <coughs> and despite of that, having a woman in uh, the head or in e chairing the, e the national as national coordinator of anti-corruption, it, um, it is a good thing, not just only because I've been there, but uh, it takes seriously all the, the minor efforts in order that could have some results for uh, fighting against corruption. And it's not an easy task to be in power. It's too difficult. It's uh, with a lot of challenges. I've always uh, thought that uh, might be this is not uh, what I want to do. With all the difficulties, or when I saw my boy, that uh, uh, my child that has been always like, um, always very frightened what will happen with her, with his mother, or uh, without uh, having this uh, real care that a mother that is not so busy could give to, to her boy. But I think that with our contribution and uh, uh, why I have been in this position is that I want to, to, to contribute for, for my country and uh, I want to do something and to put some milestone in each uh, field or in each area that I've worked. And the same uh, I'm doing even now as an MP. Of course, small steps, but uh, it is important to be steady steps. Thanks Good. a lot. Thank you. Before we go on, I would like to uh, uh, give a short presentation for our uh, other member of the panel, uh, Ms. Violeta Jovanovic who since the year 1998 has been building expertise in the field of local development 
as an expert and team leader on the USAID programs in Serbia and the region through designing, advocating, and implementing development projects worth over $10 million. As the first employee of NALED uh, in the position of executive director since 2007, she initiated the independence and construction of a membership organization that later grew into the largest public-private association focused on building an environment for business in Southeast Europe. Welcome, uh, Mrs. Jovanovic. So we'll get uh, back to our uh, uh, line of uh, questions for Ms. Gashi, who, uh, as we said before, uh, from Costa Rica to Kosovo. You uh, have a very interesting story, uh, 10,000 miles away from Kosovo, and then you left all, all of that. Uh, it was basically all you knew, being born there, and then uh, came to Kosovo, uh, uh, and you are now in a position of leadership. How would you describe this, this arch uh, of your story? Uh, uh, that's good, right now, good? yeah, cool. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you to Western Balkan Fund team for putting together this event and for bringing us to discuss about uh, the future forward and share a bit of our stories. A disclaimer, I was not born in Costa Rica, no. um, but I was born in a beautiful town called Zilan in the southeast of Kosovo, uh, a town that one wouldn't skip as a tourist location, but would dive deep into understanding the rich culture and the hospitality of people. So I think for me, uh, that's what connects. I used to have a neighbor, unfortunately she passed away recently, but she was always a sort of a driving force of my neighborhood. The lady, her name called Nazlia, who was uh, 89 year old and passed away last year, was in a way a connection being 10,000 miles away. I think it's important to, to talk about the journeys, but I think it's more important to talk about the people that we meet throughout the journeys. For me, throughout my, my, my journey of being be it in Costa Rica, Argentina, US, it was always that sense of duty that connected me be to Kosovo, to its people, but most importantly, to its reality. My commitment to, to my country wasn't just uh, by uh, being a citizen of Kosovo. It was its rich culture history and its tragic recent uh, past. But it's also its potential to develop and to, to move it forward, to shake it a bit. Huh? And as I begin my journey as a high schooler, I happened to stop in Costa Rica because the post-war Kosovo also opened a lot of opportunities to, to reimagine the world in terms of how we see uh, the future of our country. Throughout my journey of education, which I was lucky, but I wouldn't just say lucky, I was also a hard worker in the term of being lucky, to move forward in places of opportunities where I could develop skills that could later serve in life uh, for, for where I am today. And so I, as I began my journey in Costa Rica, I realized the power of citizen diplomacy. I realized the power of stories. I happened to be in a very tropical country with very little connection to my country of origin, with very little reality, actually, as I decided to move to Costa Rica for a high school, a lot of what my surrounding was talking about, that country was prejudiced, stereotypes. All they knew was tequilas and, and good men. There was more to Costa Rica than tequilas and good men. It was a lot to develop uh, and to gain from a country that uh, first had no, no war in its history, has no army, but most importantly had a, a sense of community that was as strong as the community I was leaving behind, mm -hmm. which was Kosovo. It was during my time in Costa Rica that I also realized the power of sharing, whether it be from conflicted areas, whether it be it from, from two sides of the stories, and whether it be it from two edges of the perspectives in terms of what we believe is right and wrong. Because huh? there is a very thin line for people, and especially in today's world with a lot of disinformation and a lot of drama going on on, on, a, on a very short life spam screen. People get to make uh, contacts uh, and make, make these contacts a reality and factual proven sta statements that they belong to. And so I think here is where I felt I play a role. I shared the story of my country. I shared the reality of the newborn Kosovo. And Kosovo, also Costa Rica happened to be the first country to recognize Kosovo. I mean, I didn't do anything about it directly. <laughs> Let's just be honest. But my cousins and 
my, my, my close family thought that I was their ambassador at the time. Huh? I was there and Kosovo happened to be recognized. So as I travel on this part, I continue to share these experiences because I think it's, it's whether you are a hundred miles away, a thousand, a ten thousand, the sense of origin and the sense of duty is what we carry. Look, uh, in, in, in my due to do days of job, I'm not luckily the first one, nor the last one. I mean, in this room, I see former chief negotiator of Kosovo-Serbia dialogue, Ms. Edita Tahiri, former deputy minister, Ms. Sahatsiu, directors of multiple uh, municipality directorate, members of civil society. So there's, everybody has a piece of story. And everybody has some sense of duty and commitment mm -hmm. to this story. The question is, how far can we go in terms of detaching from the day-to-day -day reality by living the moment yet contributing to the next moment to be created? And I think that's where I see my story fitting in and coming back. My biggest cause, and I continue to remain very tight to my cause, is connecting diaspora communities uh, to their homeland to their country of origin, because along the journey, I found multiple people who, f in one way or another, living in between realities, have built so much commitment to their cause to give back. So the sense of community and unity, but it's also the sense of commitment of giving back in terms of uh, making an impact. Sometimes your giving back, uh, from your perspective, might be the best case scenario. But then when you come in to give back, you might end up in a stumbling block uh, that some folks tell you, wait, what you're trying to do is completely crazy. But I think on this unstoppable uh, theme, uh, I'm, back to, I'm back to Kosovo uh, for now uh, five years after my, my journey of education. I haven't left Kosovo because I wanted to just go abroad. I left Kosovo because I wanted to go on a journey to gain skills that could help me to be in a position where I could make the impact. I've always tried for impact, particularly this so that, impact. That was a goal from, it was from always, the beginning. It was something that was instilled in me mm -hmm. throughout my journey, be it coming from my, my neighbor that just passed uh, recently, or from the history of my people for struggle and for liberation that have brought me to a position where I need not just to work harder, but also to reflect on the past and to realize that it's our duty to make the place of origin a better place. It's not the duty of someone who hasn't been in that place to come and fix it for you. Right. It's our duty. Right. So that's why uh, I, I, I think of Kosovo 10,000 miles away. And on today's work, I think of Kosovo be 10,000, 15, because it's my, my, my daily job as well, in addition for being my pride, my commitment, and my duty to being a long-serving citizen of a place that I call home. Good. Yeah. Well, it's good to hear that. Well, we go to Miss uh, Isaki now. Uh, well, uh, Miss Gashi just, just mentioned that, that uh, you are not alone. You're not the first. You're not the last women uh, to lead. Uh, but still, uh, some people ask that question as to how it is to be in the government, uh, a mother, in academia, a student of PhD as well. So how do you juggle and, uh, and uh, get all of this done at the same time? Thank you, Blendy. So uh, in the beginning, I'm uh, honored to, to take part in this conference and to share some of experiences with other <coughs> women and men uh, and to find solution to overcome barriers to success. Um, when we talk about success and uh, women in leading positions, it is still uh, very, very important to talk about these issues because even though there are some steps forward for uh, women that we have in leading positions, but we have to achieve at least 50-50, uh, but we think that we can do more. Uh, and this is the opportunity where we can uh, talk about uh, our experiences to share with them. And also maybe we can learn from uh, experiences of uh, other women who take part in this conference. So uh, I started my studies and uh, uh, I finished with a, a very good grade. So uh, I had scholarship 
And I never thought that I one day I'm going to be a woman in a leading position. But uh, after that, I started to train volleyball, and I played volleyball for 13 years, and I think that uh, it helped me a lot because sports help women uh, to work together in a team without thinking of being leaders. But uh, you start being a leader since uh, you become uh, greater sp sports women. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had the, the chance to be a playmaker and maybe that helped me to organize the, the play and it helped me also in politics to work with other women. I'm in a leading position right now, but I've never wanted to be mentioned as deputy minister and you have uh, just to uh, commend to other people so they can do their, they have to do certain job for you. But always I have been in the group with uh, those women. In our ministry, uh, we organized an international conference on women in foreign policy and this year is going to be organized for the third time in a row. And uh, we achieved to create a network of women diplomats of Western Balkan Six. And this is for the first time that we achieved all together to create a network, to share experiences and to learn from each other. And I think that we have motivated other countries North Macedonia has motivated other countries to keep on with uh, topics related to women <coughs> issues. We also, as government, we, uh, we uh, uh, as uh, the government of uh, Republic of uh, North Macedonia, we have a program uh, for Sustainable Development Agenda 2030. Uh, we have Strategy on Gender Equality 2021-2026 it has been adopted as comprehensive framework which, uh, with activities for further promotion of gender equality and the status of women, as well as new law on gender equality. From a legislative point of view, the adoption of the law on protection and prevention of discrimination in 2020, as well as the law on protection from violence against women and domestic violence in January 2021, uh, which is very, uh, very important. So we thought that uh, uh, we don't have gender-based violence in our country, but during the COVID time, we saw that gender-based violence still exists. And also, that is a very important topic that we have to talk about. So uh, since we, we are considered as leaders, we have to, to talk about other issues as well, not just politics. This panel that I'm participating uh, is named uh, Rising Up, the Science Between Lasting Leadership. And we ask ourselves, what does this mean? Is there, is there a formula for lasting leadership? And what does it take to be a leader? It is said that true leader is someone who comprises strong, uh, uh, who is respected, has belief, passion and compassion. But these are four key elements, but also women have these elements, so they can be uh, strong leaders. Uh, we can add also for female that uh, the voice of uh, women, her intuition, the way of thinking, responsibility, politeness, and the sense of humor can also uh, uh, soften even the, the harshest heart. So uh, women are life motivators, they are givers, uh, they give hope, uh, they give chance in social, political and, and economic life. Um, as I said, I have played volleyball for 13, uh, 13 years professionally and uh, I used to be ambassador of my country without knowing that I am ambassador of my, my country. And after that, when I came to diplomacy, um, I, I have told all the workers that we work together that uh, I have been ambassador. So I'm very happy to represent my country and also uh, Albanian women because I'm uh, the only Albanian women in the government and uh, I have uh, my, my duty is, uh, let's say, double duty. 
uh, because I represent female of North Macedonia and also Albanian female. And uh, uh, it is, uh, uh, my duty is, let's say, sure. harder than, uh, uh, than being just a woman. So uh, I want to motivate all other women and uh, I don't want to be seen just as a leader, but I want to be seen as a person who uh, gives hand to other women and to, to take part in politics and in decision-making processes and to, to make uh, the voices of those people who cannot be heard to be heard by ourselves. Mm. It's very interesting. Thank you. It reminds me, in, in, the, in, in the Bible, God speaks about him being the Alpha and the Omega, uh, true leader, but also... It, is the first and the last, and, and women remind me of that. That they are, uh, they are leading, but they're also uh, pushing forward other people. They are raising uh, other people up, and uh, uh, I, th what you said just reminds me of that. Here's another quote, not from the Bible this time, um, but this is something that I would pose to uh, Mrs. Uh, Vavzik. There is a quote that says, "It's the duty of every wise person to seek out people with potential." and freely guide them on the path of wisdom. By doing so, the wise leaders of the future are born, and the world will have a chance to mend itself. By providing hundreds of grants every year, one could argue that the International Visegrad Fund is doing exactly that. It's creating future leaders. I'd like you uh, to talk to us about that, as to when you distribute this, this grants, this money, uh, as to how you are also processing uh, the, the thought of, of uh, make, uh, strengthening the leaders of the future through these donations. Uh, hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, I'm very happy to be here. It's difficult to say something smart after speeches of uh, such wonderful, uh, powerful women. Um, I'm a simple CV servant uh, working uh, before for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Poland and right now for the International Visegrad Fund. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, there is a Visegrad group, a uh, political platform of collaboration uh, of Hungary, Czech Republic, uh, Poland and Slovakia. We are based in Bratislava in Slovakia. Um, and this Visegrad group, after 10 years of uh, collaborating, decided to, uh, to give birth uh, to their child, and they established, they founded Visegrad Fund. Um, four countries, they contribute uh, financially to a Visegrad Fund budget. And we as a secretariat, we are 18 people in Bratislava, we organize several calls uh, during uh, a budgetary year, and we distribute uh, grants to organizations, to non-governmental organizations, to civil society organizations, and as well to uh, individuals. We, um, we provide scholarships, and we are working right now on a fellowships program right now uh, as well. Um, I would say that our applicants, they are already kind of leaders. Uh, because uh, the, the purpose of the Visegrad Fund was to um, let know each other better. We, 20 years ago, as four countries, we noticed that um, people from our region are always oriented naturally after communism to West. Uh, but in fact, we don't know each other so well. Uh, we have common past. Uh, we have a lot of cultural sim similarities. We have centuries of collaborations. Uh, but nowadays, we don't know each other. And to have stronger voice uh, in Europe, um, in global politics, it's better to, to collaborate and to uh, speak uh, together. So uh, what is our goal is to... Um, put people from those four countries together to let them organize different kind of projects uh, 
from all possible fields, like culture, education, innovation, research, um, and to construct something together. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, we are open as well to Western Balkans and Easter Partnership. Our grants are also possible uh, for applicants uh, from, uh, from those countries. Uh, and our grantees, they represent very often small organizations, very local ones, and they are local leaders. So uh, giving them chance to finance their ideas in this way would develop leadership in the region. Good. Uh, Mrs. Reitzewitz, uh, I'd like you to uh, tell us a little bit more about your work. You uh, uh, have daily dealings with violence against women, uh, cases of rape, abuse, domestic abuse, harassment. Uh, so you've seen some of the, the worst that can happen. Uh, but we've also seen um, stories of, of women that uh, have been abused but uh, in that condition, they, they find the strength to, to rise up as true leaders uh, that they probably might have not done in, in a different situation. So this, this, uh, uh, this difficulty turns into an opportunity for them. So, so tell us a little bit more about the cases you see and, and if you believe that there can be leaders found in shelters for women. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Yes, uh, actually, yes, there were a lot of leader, leaders in that shelter. Even uh, none of them knew that they were leaders. Not even us who were just starting to, to deal with such a difficult topic as violence against women. Uh, that I'm talking about uh, the year 2000, 2001, when we didn't have um, uh, the notion of leadership as such, nor uh, such wonderful conferences where, where we could learn what actually leadership is. I would say that we just um, gathered ourselves uh, in order to do something about violence against women. We knew it was a wide present, but I, I would say that we were really overwhelmed with the uh, testimonies of women we, we were hearing on a daily basis. So um, we were, of course, uh, that was a sort of motivation for us, but um, those stories were really difficult. We were dealing with the women, uh, even girls who were uh, abused, who were victims of uh, sex trafficking, uh, many of them uh, old, only like 10, 12, coming from different countries, etc. But what, what we actually uh, used from that experience, even though I have to say that uh, that kind of experience is really not only um, uh, give you some sort of uh, indirect trauma that we were not aware of at the time, mm -hmm. They also were extremely important learning experience for us, something that uh, uh, taught a lot about ourselves, but also um, taught us how little women need to keep going. So I would say that actually that is the question or the answer to a question on motivation. So um, what, what actually we, we, we learned is that, uh, that women need safety to, to actually achieve their full potential. And of course, um, that referred to all women, not only to those who are in the shelter. We all need to be safe to achieve our full potential. And also, uh, that safety doesn't mean only uh, to be safe from physical harm, but also to be safe to um, stick to our choices uh, when they are not uh, typical, uh, without being, uh, having, being feared from um, hate speech, um, defamation, uh, all kinds of silencing that we usually uh, receive not only from the society but sometimes in, from the persons closest to us at a quite early age. So um, I would say that actually uh, when you talk about safety it seems so little but actually it's huge. It's something that, is, that really um, means a lot and I think that we should really talk uh, about it uh, more often because uh, we, are, uh, we are facing the lack of safety, and I, I could also refer to what Ms. John I said, <coughs> how important actually it, it is to feel safe. And uh, it's not like women stick to, to, to being safe. They usually do all kinds of things even when they know they, they, aren't, they aren't. And uh, that's actually where I see the true potential for leadership that uh, probably every woman have, but maybe many of them doesn't know they have it. Mm -hmm. 
So I would say that uh, not only safety, uh, that shelter I worked for uh, for 10 years, not only gave women a roof under their head and that kind of physical safety, they also gave them the opportunity to uh, talk about experiences without being judged, also to stick to their cho choices, even when their family's tradition is not allowing them to do so. And uh, that was something that was really amazing. Uh, that was something for me personally, like a huge revelation where I really um, discovered uh, that things can be truly dif dif different in our society. So that was something that I uh, brought with me also in Women's Rights Center when it was established 10 years ago, where I work with amazing uh, women who are actually the team uh, that is uh, working together and um, that uh, really share uh, much more than just um, uh, project goals and that kind of things. I would say that uh, what is the specifics uh, of the our organization is that we actually tend to share, uh, to care about each other, to also share our emotions, not only uh, activities and things that should be done, we also tend to, um, to um, uh, contrast our opinions. We do stick to our decisions, but we think that we are also, our opinions should, should be flexible and we should be able to change. Yeah. So, uh, and what is also very important, and I would like to emphasize a lot, because, particularly because of my personal experience with working with uh, traumatized women, is we also try to talk more about self-care. Uh, that is something that women are not taught uh, very often, not, nor from their families, nor from the society. And I saw too many of wonderful women that were actually burned out. So I would say that we really need to, uh, to think about how we can also uh, make ourselves resilient from, from all kind of uh, pressures, uh, experiences, etc. And uh, uh, that's why we are also, of course, uh, share uh, the, the, the advices about self-care, mm -hmm. let's say, mm -hmm. and also try to share it with women who are coming to us. So I would say that uh, actually we need to, to be aware that we should be able to stop sometimes in order to become unstoppable and to just reflect on ourselves, to think, uh, uh, is it something that I want to do or I'm doing that because somebody else is expecting or take care about our also well-being and health and everything. Yeah. So I would actually, um, if you ask me about the leadership style, I, I appreciate a lot. It's actually that empathetic leadership we, we saw from uh, um, ex-Prime Minister of New Zealand, for example. And I think that women uh, should be also able to share not only the ideas, uh, institutional memory to each other, uh, which is lacking, uh, to be honest, because we have one huge piece of our history that is almost um, cancelled. Uh, and I'm talking, since I'm coming to, from Montenegro, that was Yugoslavia at the time, we had a huge um, uh, experience of women who were organized in the anti-fascist movement who were actually almost uh, diminished from our history books. So new generations uh, doesn't know that they, are, they were existing and that they were so successful. They did so much for our society. So I think it's very important to to share the institutional memory, to be enabling also to other women, and uh, but also to not to be afraid to share emotions, yeah. fears, and also um, those um, not to be over controlling, but also to be uh, stimulating for others and uh, to show a personal weakness sometimes, so that other women know that they don't have to be all of a sudden, they don't mm -hmm. have to be perfect. Like there are many flaws that we all have as human beings, and I think it's very important the future leaders uh, should be aware of that and th that should be also able to uh, perceive them themselves as such, to learn from those mistakes and flaws and to, as I said, uh, become more happy, healthy and resilient. And everything else, I'm sure, will come afterwards. I love that point. <laughs> I'll take that with me. It's necessary to stop sometimes in order to be unstoppable. Ms. Jovanovic, um, I'd like you to uh, maybe teach us a little bit as to what it takes to be a woman that starts at, at some, I won't say low, but it starts uh, at some point in their career and then rises up to lead an association that's one of the largest in the continent. Um, what are the qualities that are necessary in order to be able to do that and do that successfully? Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and um, greetings, Teranat, um, to all present here. Greetings from Nalit Belgrade. 
Um, I feel truly privileged to be a participant in the conference and to be on the ranks of uh, such esteemed panelists. So thank you for uh, the invitation and the opportunity to exchange with you all. Um, I, I can start off by um, sharing an anecdote, um, which is also partly a response to your question. Um, and it relates to how I um, got to be the executive director of Knowledge. Um, so in 2007, I um, used to work for a USAID-funded program uh, that was based in Novi Sad, and it was coming to an end. <coughs> and uh, Novi Sad is the north of the country. Um, and um, as it was, uh, as my contract was uh, approaching to an end, I, I started looking for other jobs. And uh, it happened then that another USAID program in Belgrade was looking for a person of my. Um, profile and they interviewed me. I did so well in the interview and they said, okay, you're hired. We'll start in about a month. And I took this time to, to start looking for a place in Belgrade to live and uh, getting ready to move to the capital. Um, was all excited about it and um, then comes the date of uh, when, when I'm supposed to start and uh, they're just not returning my calls. and. Uh, <laughs> I pick up the phone and I call a person working there, Anna Brnabic, a, a colleague of mine. And I say, Anna, what's, what's going on? Why are you not returning my calls? And she says, oh, uh, no one talked to you? Uh, well, it happened that the donor um, removed this component from the program, so um, unfortunately this is not happening. But know what? Uh, we have a, um, a position. We are, we are actually advertising to, to find a, an executive director for a newly formed organization, and you can apply there. And I said, well, thank you. That's uh, so comforting <laughs> to know. And I said, well, what's the, what's the organization all about? And she says, it's, it's called Naled. And I said, oh, what a funny name for the organization. I can only imagine what this is all about. And I went to the website, and I couldn't at all understand uh, what this organization was supposed to do. And uh, uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, funny expressions to me at the time, like regulatory reform, uh, decentralization. I had no clue about this. So I went to the interview. Um, and I did very poor in the interview, frankly, because they asked me so many questions I had no clue about. And uh, uh, there was excellent competition there, and I got to be hired. So <laughs> it's uh, usually uh, things happen unexpectedly, and it was actually uh, the, the, the committee that was interviewing the candidates, and Anna being there, she knew me for a number of years. Um, they, they selected me because they expected me to do well in, in this position. Um, however, they did hire me for a month. So they said, you're going to be the executive director of the organization for a month, and then we'll see what happens next. And then I worked for a month, they extended it for another three months, and now it's been, um, what, almost 17 years uh, that I have been running the organization. And nowadays I feel very, um, very proud that we managed to build um, a very strong, um, uh, visible, uh, productive organization that is uh, making a difference in Serbia, um, and I would say across the region. And um, uh, we have been able to position ourselves as a, a key um, counterpart to the government of Serbia in, uh, um, in implementing business environment reforms. And um, we have been either the initiator or the implementer of many of those um, alongside um, our, our government leaders. And, um, um, our presence, um, apart from Serbia, also extended to the region of the entire Western Balkans, including uh, Slovenia and Croatia. And uh, that's another reason for um, making me so pleased to be, to be here and to, to meet you all. Um, but to go back to the, to the question, so um, uh, what it takes to grow an organization, it takes a lot of um, capable, determined, agile, self-reliant women. Um, because in this um, uh, business of ours, which includes a lot of dialogue, negotiation, um, listening and hearing, um, and then translating this into uh, messages that can be uh, communicated well, it usually takes women, at least uh, in the country where I come from. 
Um, and initially when the organization was small and um, unknown and even didn't have much funding or support, we didn't really have a long line of candidates who wanted to, to join the organization and work for it. So this is when I again turned to, to some colleagues of mine um, um, who used to also work with me in, in, in USAID and, and other programs <laughs> and that agreed to join the organization. And um, um, we agreed to support each other in building it further. Um, and as I said now, it's uh, one of the, the most successful ones. Uh, still, it's, um, uh, I would say, a female-dominated team because uh, women are like uh, almost 70% of the organization. We are looking for, for male colleagues, but it happens so that most of the time it's, uh, it gets to be a, a female candidate. Um, we are um, um, an agent that is uh, recognized across the region, and I'm uh, very pleased uh, that we are also very actively working with uh, colleagues and partners in Albania, a number of, of your institutions here and the government, local governments as well, and we are looking to, um, to grow this relationship, and we believe that women could be the bridge for reuniting the region for reconciliation, for uh, building bridges that can uh, bring us uh, back together, uh, that can make us closer in uh, understanding each other's perspective and, and working together to bring the region uh, forward. And um, I would uh, definitely uh, um, uh, put forward a, a hand of cooperation and um, um, trying to uh, work together on, on this issue. And I believe in this uh, conference room, there are many women who are doing the same. And I would suggest that we uh, join our uh, forces in, in doing so. Uh, just two other things I wanted to mention. One is women in um, leadership positions, especially in institutions and business. Um, uh, we see a rise in, in those positions in Serbia, at least. And this, this is something we find very encouraging to have women as uh, ministers, mayors, um, prime ministers, uh, governors of the national banks, and, and we think it's a, it's a great signal, especially to, to girls and young women that are just uh, about to start their careers. Um, what is uh, uh, lacking, though, at least um, in Serbia, in, in a large number of, of these situations, is women taking charge. So this is what we want to see happen. Because oftentimes um, women, let's say, get installed by men into these positions and then they feel indebted. They, they feel like they owe something to, to their sponsor and that they should uh, always put someone else forward. So we want women to speak for themselves. They're enough. They deserve those positions. And we expect them to take charge by um, putting together uh, balanced um, public policies, especially gender balance. They will they will um, be inclusive of all uh, uh, marginalized groups in, in our societies and giving more equal opportunities to, to men and women alike. And uh, this is what we are vouching for and we try to set an examples, uh, is example by what we do. Uh, however, this process is slow and I understand this to be a challenge uh, across the region and, and the globe. And another thing also, uh, and I'll close with this, is uh, rural women that are very disadvantaged, at least in Serbia. This is also my pet peeve because in my voluntary capacity, I, um, I'm the president of um, a national um, association called Etnomreža. It gathers women, there are usually such associations in each one of our countries. Um, they get uh, um, artisans, women who are long-term unemployed and they deal with handicrafts. Um, and we do um, a lot in Serbia to, to improve their position and to help them in generating income and feeling good about what they do because they are the guardians of our country's traditions. Um, and um, one of the ways we are promoting um, um, their role is by using the items that they make as business and diplomatic gifts. So our uh, government leaders, frequently uh, use these items um, as, as protocol, as cultural diplomacy in meeting their uh, colleagues from, from other countries. And this is a very strong message that is uh, 
uh, uh, sent by this gesture, especially to the women, because they know that what they are able to do matters. Uh, not just for their families and for their own budgets, it matters for the country. And this is, uh, again, another uh, line of activity where I'd like us to, uh, to connect. We have partners in some of the, the countries um, of the region, but we'd like to connect you all, and we're seeking partners in Albania for, for joint projects. So I'd really, um, I'd be very happy if this um, gathering of ours resulted in many new connections, new partnerships, and us working together for the future of our region. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Professor Gray, I would like you to, uh, um, there was something you said this morning on, on the radio show that uh, really struck me, and, and, uh, and uh, Ms. Jovanovic just mentioned it as well. Uh, a warning that you had against uh, uh, artificial uh, uh, positions of power for women, when they are put there by, by somebody else, or when it's just quotas that are good on paper, um, and, and you called for real change that would be uh, on a cultural, societal level. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I can explain that a little bit. But first of all, it's my great pleasure to be here. It's my first time in the Balkans. So it's a little bit difficult for me to talk about the situations in the countries in this area. But I can give some perspective on how Japan approaches these issues, perhaps. Um, before I talk about my research that looks at the topic we mentioned today, uh, I should mention my university in Japan was founded by a woman called Sudo Umeko who 150 years ago when Japan first opened up to the rest of the world, it sent out its young people to bring back Western technology and Sudo Umeko was sent out when she was seven years old to America and she spent 12 years there before coming back and after she came back and she saw the conditions for women that there was no access to academia, she established a, a women's university so that women would have those opportunities. But the gender norms at that time were so strict that Japan had very strong nationalism that focused people on serving the country. Their life was to be given to making Japan strong. One of the organizers here mentioned to me that he'd heard that in Japan you have a job for life. It's not really that, it's that in Japan your job is your life. In when I meet people here, I would say, hello, my name is Gavin, I'm from Tsuda University. In Japan, I'd say, no. I'm Tsuda University's Gavin. Uh, the company comes first, that is your identity. And for men, the company is their life. It takes priority over family. And for women, raising children takes priority over their own interests. And those gender norms are changing, but they're changing slowly. And my research in Japan is looking at the situation, uh, trying to find the bad points that exist, the differences that are being, um, how those problems are being met in other ways in other countries. And through that, I've also found that Japan actually does some good things. But talking about the bad points, just as an example, um, you might know sexual assault uh, referral centers, SARCs. In Japan, women have many rights by law and many support services. But because it's a very patriarchal society, these have been designed and implemented by men who don't understand what women really need. And so I've gone with young women and brought them to these places. And they're very scary. They're ominous, tall buildings with no decorations, concrete walls, guards on the gate that you have to sign in. And even I going there feel uncomfortable. So the young women going there feel almost traumatized again. In comparison, in my own country, which is Ireland, we have a sexual assault referral center called a Rowan. And everything about it has been designed with survivors in mind. It's set off in a, a wooded area away from other buildings. Uh, the buildings are designed to be very natural looking and comfortable. Uh, it has two different entrances, so the first time you arrive, you use the main entrance, but after that, there's a side entrance, so people coming the second time won't be reminded of the first time, which might have had traumatic memories connected to it. But everything is done with women in mind, and women have played a role in designing it. And in Japan, that what needs to change. It needs to have more women in positions where these decisions are shaped for women's needs. But the good thing about Japan is that it's very good at taking in ideas from the outside, like it did with Tsuda Umeko, bringing back new ideas. And Japan's difference maybe from European countries is that its primary target is social harmony. It knows everybody will disagree, but disagree in a way where people can work together and cooperate and have a level of social harmony. And it does this in many ways by 
not setting strict laws at the top level. So the Jap even in business, the Japanese management method is middle management. The bosses don't tell people you have to do this. They ask the middle managers, talk to your staff, talk to the people underneath you, find out what's necessary, come up with a plan, and then tell me. And if it's good, I'll give you the go ahead. And in politics, it works the same way. They don't introduce strict quotas, but they introduce systems that ask groups within society to try and come up with solutions themselves, to try and get more people involved, more aspects of society. And they've done this in certain ways. Recently, they had the gender equality law in politics a few years ago. And also, a couple of years ago, they revised their corporate governance laws. And both of them were to encourage political parties and businesses to take a more active role in building gender equality within their systems and displaying that to the public so the public could see which political parties are being active, which businesses are being active. And you start to see this now today when I woke up, I saw an article from Japan that Panasonic has introduced a new uh, law where there will be a no strikes policy for gender harassment. And in Japan, that's remarkable because gender harassment has long been a problem. But now they've said, no, we're not accepting it anymore. That's not just one change. That signifies that within that company, they've looked at it, this issue. They've had countless meetings about it. They've brought in trainers. They've talked about it. It represents the entire institution of Panasonic taking a new stance on gender equality. And that's what Japan tries to do. It doesn't try to force the issue and say, this is the rule. You have to follow it. They realize that by doing that, if people follow the rule, there will still be tension within society. Unless institutions change from within to adopt a better understanding of gender equality, a better understanding of men and women's relationships with each other, the laws themselves won't have any impact. You will still have this tension, this animosity between the genders underneath the surface. And so Japan's focus is to try and create that harmony by getting more of society involved on a deeper level to try and shift gender norms as a whole. Not to solve individual problems, but to look at the roots to try and make sure there are no problems in the future. And Japan is quite slow. People often criticize it for being slow to change. And that's because it likes to make deep change happen. It takes things slowly, it reviews them, and it tries to get all of society on board. And I think that's one of the positive things that we can take from the Japanese approach and there's a saying in Japan that you don't win by defeating your enemy. You win when they stop being your enemy. And often, when I look at America and Europe, sometimes responses to gender issues are very combative. And there's a lot of tension on both sides. And you have to try and remove that animosity by interacting with the people on the other side. Even if you find them distasteful, you have to find out where, where that anger comes from and deal with it. Because if it's just pushed aside, it will simmer underneath the surface. And without dealing with those problems, we can't really have gender equality. Because gender equality, it isn't about just boosting up women. It's about making men have better relationships with women, making men understand them more. When Japan looks at so, so the gender norms in Japan, they do affect men just as much as they do women. And there's a survey done where they were asking Japanese men, what does it mean to be a man in Japan? What's most important? They could choose many different things. 80% of them choose being a breadwinner, supporting your family. That was the number one. 40% choose not showing any emotion, keeping it inside. Only 5% chose childcare. And children are important for Japanese men. The most important thing for me in my life Japanese men care about them more, but they feel, if I choose that, that's selfish. I have to push that aside to support my family. That's my role in society. And so I know a lot of them want to be able to talk more about their emotions, be more free with them, but they feel they can't. So lifting up women isn't just putting women forward. It's giving men more freedom as well to adopt and you know, change the norms that affect them. So I think Japan's attitude of approaching this on a deep level, looking for social harmony, trying to bring people together, is something that is a positive step, perhaps. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so I'll come back again to uh, Ms. Jonai over here. Uh, being part of the media, I've had the chance to, uh, to notice it and to uh, 
witness it as to when women are in positions of power, or positions of leadership, be that in parliament, on the government, or everywhere else, differently from men, they are often mentioned for their looks. Uh, comments are made in passing uh, about their age, about how they dress. Um, so how do you, how do you uh, deal with something like that? Have you noticed it in your own career, where instead of focusing on your job, your track record, what it is that you do and how you do it, um, the media, and, 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 uh, because it, it really is uh, substantial in, in, in you know, uh, forming a mindset, uh, treats women as, or objectifies them somewhat on their feminine side, looks and, and, and such. Um, it's very good to And it watch. doesn't happen to men that often. They don't, you know, that this handsome MP or whatever, but women, yeah. Yeah, it's true. Uh, uh, I, I can just only mention the day that we have plenary, that in the uh, outside of the building, there are photographers, and they just only picture maybe, maybe do pictures just only for women, and mostly they are commented in different uh, online platforms. Right. That's what she only wore what today they to wear, yes, yeah. <laughs> wore, what uh, she looks like, uh, if she has wore a dress or uh, something else. So it's always very bad looking when you see yourself or your colleagues just only mentioning or uh, taking comments just only for the age and uh, about how you look. And it's very, it, it, it's pity. It's, it's, um, I always say, not just only for the justice system, but even on the uh, political life, even in our daily life. Uh, in the end of the day, um, it's, it's, uh, it's mentality that we have to change. It's true that uh, we are not used as society to see uh, a lot of women in power. Despite that uh, Albania situation uh, is changed. We have more 70 percentage uh, percent women in the government uh, as ministers. Uh, we have now 36 percent uh, women MPs in parliament. Uh, we have now nine mayors, mayors from 61 uh, municipalities uh, that are led by uh, men mayors. Uh, we have around 50 percent of. Uh, um, municipality councils that are uh, composed by women. But before, just only 10 years before, uh, the government has had just only 6% uh, women uh, ministers. 16% uh, women MPs in the parliament. So uh, it's, a, it's, it's a way, it's a path that we have to, to follow and even to change the way how the society see the role of the women in politics, not what she were or, or what she looks like, but what she do, what kind of contribution uh, she can give to, to the politics, to the society. And of course that uh, even when I've been in the, this position, uh, sometimes I haven't been bothered in, in, for real uh, this kind of comments, but uh, mostly, uh, I've been bothered from comments uh, uh, such as uh, black propaganda or considered black propaganda or harassment or comments that were without ethics uh, that sometimes damage a lot. Not just only the woman that has been attacked, but uh, mostly all the hope and the desire of the other women to enter in the politics yeah. and to contribute yeah. in politics. Do you, do you also think that, that women sometimes become special targets of this kind of black propaganda uh, as opposed to men where you know uh, lies are, are printed about them lies are mentioned about them um, because they are women and and they can be uh, damaged in, in that I, way I don't want to uh, to uh, be or, or to see just only vulnerability to the women but it's true because in the end of the day, uh, women care about their integrity. Women care about their 
a contribution in their in, in the life, despite what kind of position do they do they have. Uh, they care about the family. So if I'm uh, now in this position as even chairing the uh, Women Alliance of uh, members of and the peace. parliament and peace, uh, and imagine if we want and we, we have as an objective to uh, protect uh, and to advocate for women rights and imagine uh, what kind of damage it's done if one of the women MP it would be touched or attacked to the integrity or to the family. So even in the in the way how the society see or the other women see, uh, it's a big damage. And I think that it's not just only an attack to a woman that is in this position, but it's to the, all the women that want to do something for the society. And we know very well that the society is, especially the politic, is, um, is a stereotype uh, uh, with a lot of hate speech, with a lot of uh, sexism speech. And we have seen in the plenary recently, and imagine what we can do to the women and to give to them our model or our example when we are sitting in the plenary and hearing and uh, bearing any kind of uh, hate speech and uh, sexism yeah. Yeah. that the other colleagues are, are, the men colleagues are doing to the women. Of course that we want to, to fight together. Uh, sometimes it happens that when um, one of the minister colleague has been attacked in not appropriate uh, way in the media, and somebody from the other colleagues has uh, give to her a support, a public support. Mm -hmm. Then the target has been the second one. Right. And sometimes this is discouraging, in, not encouraging the women to, to protect and to be solidar with each other. So I think that we have to fight um, in order that the media, the society, could see what kind of contribution we give for, for the society in the position that we have. In the end, we want to, to put a brick in the biggest wall of the thing that we are uh, trying to contribute in politics, in economy, in social life, uh, in, in a health system. And of course, that uh, we have to do more of encouraging uh, having more women in politics. It's true that the situation in Albania is like uh, I've presented the figures, but uh, the figures count, but what counts more is the strongest voice, not just only for empowering the women in politics, but even advocating and protecting the other women uh, rights. Good. Thank you. I'd, uh, I'd like to address uh, Ms. Gashi. Um, how is it to uh, lead women and to be led by women? I guess I want to begin by stating some facts about the woman's role and to where we are. I mean, when you look Kosovo as a small, uh, vivid democracy, I'd say a thriving democracy in the Balkans and a great example of what it means to be able uh, to be out there, um, be it position or opposition, and to count the voices of women. It's a country that on its uh, 15th anniversary has two women president, uh, the highest position in the country. Uh, has had a chance to have woman deputy uh, speaker of the assembly. And in fact, we have a very strong woman who had 16 bullets during Kosovo war and 40 family members killed and got strength to regain back, to, to be in a position of power, to have multiple layers of identity, be it attacked and present in, in public and be able to, to move others, which is a, a testament of, uh, of rising up with women MPs who are not there just because of quotas. And I'm very proud of my people and my country because while quotas are important in a society is deeply rooted by patriarchal uh, norms, uh, we've gone beyond quotas. There is yet a lot of work to be done in terms of aiding women to be able to sh simply spell out their feelings, their emotions without feeling like they are going to be judged. It is out there a very uh, 
negative uh, image of looking for women in peace, not just how they dress and uh, what they do, but always when some women have some sort of a different idea, they are there to be picked and sort of utilizing the woman to belittle not just the idea, but the whole process. And so, but when it comes to men bringing an idea forward, uh, the discussion of the surrounding, and here I think there has to be a bit more work of civil society and of partners <laughs> to raise awareness of what just Professor Gray said about allowing men to be more acceptable, because uh, we're not just there for numbers. We're there because we add the contribution. And so I think working towards an equitable and inclusive society, it takes two to tango. And it takes, to begin with, in this room, having more men. Uh, congratulations for the men that are there, here to hear all these complaints and, and suggestions, but also the duty of us, men and women, is to bring this story forward and to share and to practice it and to be able to, to adapt it. But it also we have to make sure that we understand the realities of the societies where we come from. Some ideas cannot just be imposed on a direct way just because we think this is right and just. It takes time for people to, to, to reshift their way of thinking. But more importantly, I think it takes uh, experience. Look, I, I applaud my people and my country for the journey they've come because we've been isolated for so long, discriminated systematically for so long, yet we have built resiliency to still shine. And to me, that's uh, the most important part of, of the community base that despite patriarchal brutal uh, implications, we still have, have moved forward. Uh, on the lay of, I'm, I'm being led by women in, in my ministry. I am uh, um, very lucky to have uh, um, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister Gavala, to lead the way. Not just because uh, of her being a minister, but her activism, her story, her background, adds a lot of layers of me as a young policymaker in a position to learn and to be open, to reflect and to be attentive. And I see uh, along with her, but also other women, um, be it MPs from multiple parties, be it a woman in agencies, directorates, uh, local municipalities, I see similar barriers and biases in our journey. Uh, barriers be, it, you know, I've come to be very happy on countering sexism, countering ageism, and countering biases, but not on a confrontal way of telling the, the other that, look, uh, you're wrong, but on a very uh, smooth way of mm. bringing them to the picture to realize that you realize what you said. I've had ambassadors who've told me once, one ambassador particularly said, look, wow, Deputy Minister, you're so young. You could be my daughter. For a moment, I just sat back and I thought, holy moly, how is possible? But then I, I contextualized the reality of that ambassador and I said, you're, you're right, Ambassador. I could have been your daughter, but I happen to be your boss. So how can I help you? <laughs> so I think it's very important to shift the conversation, because if I was very much of, hey, this is not how it goes, you go up, because you can do that extremely. Right? Yeah, sure. But I also think there is a mere uh, importance on, on the dialogue be it a dialogue on ethnic lines, be it dialogue of layer of identities, be it dialogue on realities. The dialogue piece needs to be there, but it also, you cannot have a dialogue if you dismiss the other voices. And often, here's where a lot of women that I've worked with and I've seen on a journey often go wrong. I think trying to be the only vagina in the room, <coughs> it's a problematic issue that we have. And that is a problem, particularly on our region, because in our region, being the only woman in the room adds a lot of power. There's five men and one woman, and it's all, I am the first. But the balance, because often when two women are in the room, the chances of the woman idea moving forward is 99.9%. .9%. But if you're <laughs> the only woman in the room, your idea could easily be shut without you even noticing that they shut you down. So your job and our job is to make sure we are not the only woman in the room because we need a friend in the room. So that's, that's my part. All right.
Here's the girlfriends. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I feel great. I feel great. Um, this is Saga. You you mentioned your uh, sports uh, sports experience before. 13 years of volleyball, and uh, you know uh, how that. And I'm connecting this to what uh, Ms. Gashi just said. Uh, you know, you, you have these teammates, and they are, you are, they are your family. They are your your fighting tribe, if uh, if I might call them so. And, and and you raise each other up. You you are leaders all at the same time. Uh, what message would you give? Uh, it's obvious that we need more women in uh, positions of power. Be that in our communities, uh, in our governments, uh, in our sports, uh, wherever. What message would you give to younger women um, as to how they find their voice, their, their calling, their strength, and, and then grab those positions and lead? First of all, okay. First of all uh, I would like to say that they have to work hard uh, to stand in themselves and uh, to be strong to say what they have to say, don't be afraid, so say what you have to say, take your seat, if uh, there is a saying, if uh, on the table there is no seat for you, you bring your chair, something, okay. <laughs> I, I, uh, so make your space, and uh, uh, also, I always say, uh, we have to think of other female as, as, uh, as well, not just ourselves, but we have to give hand to other female to bring them and to shine. So when we shine together, we uh, give more light to, to the others. Uh, and uh, uh, don't be afraid to say what you have to say. Mm -hmm. This will be uh, mm -hmm. my saying for today. Excellent, thank you. Uh, going back, uh, Ms. Vavjik. Uh, going back to uh, the history of your organization, the IVF, our International Visegrad uh, Fund. It was formed to assist the EU candidacy of your country, Poland, the Czech Republic, the Hung uh, Hungary, and uh, Slovakia. But since then, it has grown into one of the most influential organizers uh, in Eastern Europe with a special focus 